We've all heard of region lock content when it comes to media products. TV shows, movies and games that are only accessible in certain countries. But what about region locked mysteries? Unsettling events that occurred in far off lands that rarely, if ever, get reported on in English. Those cases could be some of the most infamous in a country's history. But if their only sources are written in their native language, you'll likely never hear about them. That's where translation skills come in handy. Learning a language can open up a world of new information, perspectives, and possibilities that you'd otherwise not have access to. And that's why I'm happy to introduce today's sponsor, Babbel. Language learning that works. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world that can help you become proficient in loads of different tongues, from French to Indonesian, by teaching you language that natives actually use. Their lessons prepare you for practical, everyday conversations about travel, business, relationships and more. Buenos dias. With just 10 to 15 minutes of practice per day, Babbel's proven to get you start speaking a new language in three weeks. Since their lessons are designed by real teachers, I found them really intuitive and engaging, and I can feel myself progressing with each Babbel session. Espero que disfrutes el video. It's honestly been fun to break my routine and challenge myself, while also doing something productive and learning something useful. With Babbel's 20-day money-back guarantee, you've really got nothing to lose. Click the link in my description box to get 60% off your Babbel subscription today, and let me know what language you sign up for in the comments. Today's first incident took place in Japan, back in the year 2000. It was May the 4th, and while for the rest of the world, the only cause for celebration was International Star Wars Day, the Japanese were actually halfway through their longest national holiday, Golden Week. A time of celebration where workers and students alike get to enjoy a prolonged break. One young man who was planning to make the most of his time off was 17-year-old construction worker Taiki Fujii. That evening, he and his girlfriend had been enjoying the summer festivals held in their home city of Ushiku, Ibaraki Prefecture. It had been a long but bumpled day, full of parades and music, and the young lovers had developed quite the thirst. At approximately 12.30am, the parched couple made their way to a nearby Maruya supermarket, where they planned to buy a drink at one of the outdoor vending machines. By that point, the streets were practically deserted, or so it seemed. As the couple stood there, deciding which beverage to purchase, a group of four young males approached them from the other side of the road. Neither Taiki nor his girlfriend recognised any of them. Completely unprovoked, these four men suddenly became extremely aggressive, prompting the couple to flee into the adjacent parking lot. Unfortunately, the girlfriend was unable to outrun her pursuers, but Taiki wasn't about to leave her to fend for herself. He did his best to push away the four assailants, but that only served to enrage them further. They forced both Taiki and his girlfriend into the supermarket's dark emergency stairwell, out of eyeshot and earshot of any passers-by. Inside, one of the four men held the girlfriend in place, while the other three relentlessly beat Taiki to a pulp. His head was repeatedly slammed into the concrete walls and floor. Unable to fend off three opponents, all Taiki could do was curl up into a ball and shield his head as best he could. And all his girlfriend could do was watch on in horror and beg for the four men to stop. And yet, despite her pleas for mercy, the group continued to punch, kick and stomp on Taiki for 30 minutes straight, focusing all of their attacks on his head. Once their bloodlust had been quenched, they took a few thousand yen from Taiki's wallet before disappearing into the night, leaving their victim a bloody mess on the ground, and his girlfriend a quivering wreck. Physically, she had been left unharmed, but the image of her boyfriend being so callously brutalised had been forever engraved in her mind. She immediately called 119, Japan's emergency number. By the time medics arrived, Taiki's face had swollen to twice its normal size. At the hospital, doctors learned that the young man's brain hadn't just been damaged in the attack, it had been misshapen. 
Taiki would never regain consciousness, and tragically, nine days after the incident, he passed away from his injuries. Figuring out a motive for the attack seemed near impossible. Taiki was a moral, law-abiding young man who wasn't involved in any nefarious activities and who didn't affiliate with rotten eggs. Nobody could think of a single person who held a grudge against him. It appeared as if the four men had simply decided to attack Taiki and his girlfriend on a whim. The couple hadn't provoked them in any way. They had never even met them before in their lives. And yet, they had decided to intentionally take Taiki's life that night. The girlfriend described the attackers as best she could, and in turn, the investigators created these four sketches depicting each of the killers. Buzz cut, long hair, glasses, and beard. She said they were all Yankees, the word that Japanese people use to describe young delinquents. She also recounted some of the things that the attackers said to one another during the incident. There's a fire station nearby, said one of the men, so an ambulance will come quickly. This suggested that at least one of them was familiar with the local area. During the beating, another had apparently asked Taiki, Are you the leader of Ushiku? Ushiku being the city that they were in. It's unknown whether this was said in jest, or if the group had mistaken Taiki for the leader of a rival gang of Yankees. Taiki's girlfriend also pored over some of the local high school yearbooks, and fortuitously was able to identify a student who strongly resembled the suspect, Glasses. Though, for whatever reason, the authorities never followed up on that lead. But we'll get to that later. Early into their investigation, detectives came upon this CCTV footage, captured from inside a 7-Eleven convenience store, or Combini, just two kilometers away from the crime scene. The video shows the four suspects at approximately 10.30 p.m., two hours before Taiki and his girlfriend were ambushed. The girl was able to positively identify all four men as her boyfriend's killers. A fifth male was also captured in the footage, hanging out with the four suspects. Though he wasn't directly involved in the slaying himself, he's considered a key witness. Sadly, he has never come forward with any information. Still, the discovery of this footage so early into the investigation massively increased the odds that the suspects would be identified. By releasing it to the public, law enforcement would undoubtedly receive a high volume of tips. After all, Ushiku was a small city, with a population below 100,000 people. Somebody out there would surely recognize at least one of these suspects, and if they could apprehend just one, then the other three would surely follow soon after. And that would have almost certainly been the case, had law enforcement actually released this video to the public. You see, Investigators strongly believed that the four suspects were below the age of 18, and as such, enjoyed special legal protections. The extremely strict, some might say foolish, Japanese juvenile laws at the time meant that both the security footage and even the sketches of the killers weren't allowed to be shown to the public. No wanted posters were put up around Ushiku with their faces on, no leaflets were disseminated, no news broadcasts were allowed to show these hand-drawn images. Because of their suspected age, the murderers were essentially allowed to remain invisible. Given the brutal nature of the case, many believed that the authorities would ignore this rule, something which they had done numerous times in the past when it was in the public's best interest to do so. In this instance, however, they only went so far as to release the sketches on their official website, a page which obviously very few people visited. And as for the CCTV footage, that wasn't made available anywhere. In response, Taiki's mother made her own wanted posters, which featured the drawings of the four suspects, and began placing them in restaurant windows around Ushiku. The police took them all down, and warned her to stop meddling in their investigation. Infuriatingly, they subsequently removed the four sketches from their site's homepage as well. This didn't deter Taiki's mother, however, who refused to let her son's case be forgotten about. For years, she continued to hand out homemade flyers outside the very supermarket where Taiki's life had been stolen. 
Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, the investigation came to a near standstill at this point. The police were unable, and some might say unwilling, to pursue any further leads or interview any potential suspects. In 2003, the law surrounding juvenile protection changed in Japan, making it possible for the police to release images of wanted youths involved in violent crimes, but only if they believed that they would re-offend. Two years later, after a campaign held by Taiki's mother gained traction, the authorities finally released these four sketches to the public, five long years after Taiki had been slain. This resulted in a number of tips, the most notable of which came from a woman who claimed to be the former girlfriend of one of the killers. Apparently, he had confessed everything to her. Unfortunately, none of these potential leads were followed up on. More than a decade and a half after the incident had taken place, the authorities finally released the CCTV images of the four suspects in the Combini. I'll pass the mic over to my friend, Kyoto Robato, a fellow YouTuber who's covered this mystery in the past, and who has helped to advance the search for the perps. In late 2016, the authorities released these still close-ups of the four suspects, taken from the Combini's security camera. They were released alongside age-progressed sketches of the perps, depicting them in their mid-30s. Trouble is, the composites weren't particularly detailed, and the official images were grainy and lacking clarity. Even if someone actually knew who these young men were, it's conceivable that they wouldn't recognise them from these shots alone. In an effort to help reignite the hunt for these twisted individuals, I recently ran this image of the long-haired suspect through an AI software program. As you can see, this dramatically improved the image quality and made the killer's face a lot clearer overall. Hopefully this enhanced picture will find its way to the right person, someone who can actually put a name to the face. If you're interested, I have a channel of my own where I exclusively cover Japanese cases. There are plenty of region-locked mysteries from Japan that don't get reported on in English, and seeing how I speak Japanese, I am able to cover topics that you won't hear about on other channels. Come check it out via the links in Lazy's description box. At long last, in mid-2017, the authorities released the entire video clip to the public. Though obviously, this was too little too late and the reaction from netizens was more bitter than sweet. People began to speculate why it had taken the police 17 years to showcase such a vital piece of evidence, evidence which they had been sitting on since pretty much the beginning of the investigation. Had they just released it years prior, they would have had a decent shot at locating the perpetrators. Rumours began circulating online that the police had intentionally prevented the video from being released until the statute of limitations on the case ran its clock. In the minds of many, one of the young killers, likely Glasses, may have been the son of a high-ranking officer. That would explain why they never questioned the student from the yearbook that Taiki's girlfriend recognised, and why they seemed to be so resistant to publicising any information about the suspects. The theory goes that when the statute of limitations law was revoked in 2010, the authorities bowed to mounting public pressure and released the footage and sketches, safe in the knowledge that so much time had passed it wouldn't result in any arrests. It certainly wouldn't be the first time that the cops in Ushiku had covered up the actions of their own flesh and blood. After all, they had been caught pulling similar stunts just a couple of years prior to Taiki's slaying. Others have suggested that the four youths were part of a gang in the area, and that their boss had paid off the cops to cover their tracks. Others still prefer to apply Hanlon's razor. That is, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Needless to say, the release of the security footage didn't result in any breakthroughs. To this day, all four of Taiki's slayers remain at large, and now likely have families of their own. With Golden Week fast approaching again, I wonder if around this time of year, the memory of their murder comes back to haunt them all or if they still meet up from time to time, and reminisce about the good old days. Thanks for your help on this one, Kyoto Rabatu. Be sure to check his channel out through the links below. He's got some amazing videos, and I think you guys would really enjoy them.
A big shout out to Moondog151 over on Reddit, whose write-up of this case was an invaluable resource. The year was 1994. Born and raised in Beijing, China, 19-year-old Zhu Ling was a bright spark with an equally bright future ahead of her. Described by her classmates as attractive, intelligent, and gifted, she wasn't only talented in music and sports, but was also a smart cookie who was majoring in physical chemistry at Tsinghua University. In many respects, she was following in the footsteps of her scientifically gifted elder sister, who studied biology at the prestigious Peking University. Studied. Past tense. Unfortunately, tragedy had rocked the lives of the Ling family back in April 1989, when Zhu's sister disappeared during a hike with her classmates. Her remains were discovered three days later, at the bottom of a cliff. She had accidentally fallen to her doom. And now, just two years later, disaster was about to strike the links again. In October 1994, Zhu Ling began suffering from blurred vision and even temporary blindness. Despite being thoroughly examined, doctors weren't able to determine the root cause of her eye problems. By November, the symptoms of whatever Zhu's ailment was worsened. She began suffering from extreme stomach cramps, which made it impossible for her to eat. By late December, her hair was falling out in large clumps. Doctors ran test after test on Zhu during her stint in the hospital, but they all came back clear. Unsure of how else to proceed, they treated her with antibiotics and traditional Chinese medicine. By January, Zhu had made a full recovery. Her pain had ceased, her hair was beginning to grow back, and she was able to resume her studies at university on February 20th when the new semester began. Her two months of hell were over, and she could finally get on with her life. Just one week after returning to uni, however, on February 27th, 1995, Xu's health once again took a sudden and unexpected turn for the worse. She developed extreme pain in her legs, calves, and feet, and over the course of a month or so, that pain only became more and more severe, spreading all the way up to her waist. By the time she was admitted to hospital, the palms of her hands and soles of her feet were burning bright red. Her hair was once again falling out, and her reflexes were much slower. Still baffled, her physicians didn't bother running any more tests, and instead simply tried to treat her symptoms. This proved fruitless. Over the course of a week, her condition rapidly deteriorated. She started suffering from a loss of muscular eye control, and her face became partially paralyzed. Her speech became slurred. Soon, even something as simple as drinking water became a painful challenge. Eventually, she could no longer breathe on her own, and had to be placed on a ventilator. Evidently, the doctor's medicines weren't working. In March of that year, Xu slipped into a coma, during which time her condition only got worse. Since the doctors clearly didn't know how to treat Xu, her classmates posted an SOS letter on a number of different internet user net groups. Their posts detailed her symptoms. They received more than 1,500 responses from people in 18 different countries. Roughly one-third proposed that Zhu was suffering from thallium poisoning. Known as the poisonous poison, thallium is a metallic element that's highly toxic to humans. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and readily absorbed through the skin. The symptoms are slow-acting, painful, and wide-ranging and most notably include peripheral nerve damage and hair loss. Xu's classmates made her doctors in China aware of the possibility of thallium poisoning. The doctors ignored them completely, and continued to pump Xu full of antibiotics and antivirals. After all, Xu didn't have any contact with thallium during her studies, so that was likely not what she was suffering from. Convinced that the internet users were correct, Xu's family secretly obtained samples of her hair and sent them to a control center in Beijing for testing. Specialists got back to them with the results. As it turned out, the amount of thallium in Xu's body was 10,000 times greater than a normal person's. 
there was no way she could have ingested it accidentally. After being shown the control center's report, Shu's doctors finally gave in. Experts from around the world were contacted, and they advised treating the sick young woman with Prussian blue, a solid ion exchange material which absorbs thallium. In the end, Zhu's doctors were able to save her life, but at a heavy cost. Zhu awoke from her coma in August 1995. Unfortunately, she wasn't the same person she had been before her long sleep. Her central and peripheral nervous systems were damaged beyond repair. She was rendered near blind, had lost the ability to speak, and was left with the IQ of a six-year-old. In short, both her promising future and quality of life had been taken away from her. Chu was released from hospital in November 1995, and to this day remains in the care of her parents. Her condition has never improved. It was later determined that Zhu had repeatedly been exposed to thallium over the course of about four months, and that in the last two weeks of exposure, the thallium had been placed inside her food, dramatically ramping up the severity of her symptoms. Given that foul play was strongly suspected, detectives began investigating who had poisoned Zhu, how they had gotten it into her system, and why they wanted to end her life in the first place. To begin with, they paid a visit to Zhu's dormitory at university, only to learn that at some point in late April or early May, several items had been stolen from her room. These included her bath soap, shampoo, lipstick, contact lens case, and drinking glasses. Investigators have speculated that her poisoner laced the contents of each of these items with thallium, and that Zhu inadvertently ingested the substance via bodily contact. The investigators learned that only 200 people in all of Beijing had access to thallium, and it didn't take them long to set their sights on one suspect in particular, Sun Wei, a classmate of Zhu's who just so happened to be one of her three dorm mates. Of all of the students with a close relationship with Zhu, Sun was the only one to have official access to thallium. In fact, she was one of just eight people at the university who could get their hands on the stuff. Everything seemed to point towards her as the perpetrator. There was just one problem. There wasn't a motive. After interviewing Sun and all of Zhu's other classmates and dorm mates, it became clear that the two girls actually got along very well. Aside from the circumstantial fact that Sun had access to thallium, there wasn't any concrete evidence to link her to Zhu's poisoning. Some began to question whether Sun really was the person responsible for ruining Zhu's life, or whether she was simply being used as a scapegoat. After all, despite the university claiming that the thallium supply was secure and accessible only by those with permission, other students have confirmed that pretty much anyone with enough determination could have entered the labs and stolen some. Due to a lack of evidence, some way was never charged in Zhu's case. Nor was anyone else for that matter. Mainly because nobody else was ever properly investigated. Just because Sun wasn't charged though, that doesn't clear her of suspicion. If anyone would have had the power to escape justice, it would have been Sun. Her grandfather was a high-ranking member of the Revolutionary Committee. Her cousin was the former deputy mayor of Beijing. She came from a powerful family. When Sun was re-questioned in 1997, the detectives working the case asked her why she had checked out a book on thallium shortly before Zhu fell sick. At that point, her parents showed up and terminated the interrogation. Sun Wei went on to change her legal name and legal date of birth. She married an American and moved to the United States. In 2005, Sun broke almost 10 years of silence on the subject. She took to the internet to say that the police had cleared her as a suspect. They hadn't, and that she didn't have a motive to harm Zhu anyway. She did. A former classmate later explained that despite appearances, Zhu and Sun were actually rivals. Shortly before the first round of poisoning, Zhu had defeated Sun in a student election. The latter was apparently very bitter about the result. In this former classmate's words, Sun was simply a terrible person altogether. Rude, entitled, and unconcerned with the problems of others. In 2013, 
Xu's case began to receive a lot of attention once again, after a male student in China killed his classmate using poison. Recalling the incident that had occurred at Tsinghua University years prior, many internet users began looking up details about Xu as well, only to discover that the government had blocked all mention of her name on social media platforms. Public outrage led to this ban being lifted, and all of a sudden, there was a renewed interest in Xu's case. In September 2013, 17 years after Xu had slipped into her coma, her parents received a mysterious letter in the post. The note alleged that Zhu hadn't been poisoned by one individual at all, but by a group of students who all held a grudge against her. Here's an abridged reading of that letter. To Zhu Lin's parents. Recently, the community's been speculating about your daughter again. As a person who knows a little about it, I always felt that your daughter was the one at fault. If she hadn't disturbed other people's rest, she wouldn't have been poisoned and maimed collectively by her fellow dormitory members. The main thing in life is karma. One's own evil cause bears the evil fruit of today. Your daughter had been affecting the sleep of others for more than two years. The dormitory was in a state of semi-collapse and couldn't tolerate it any longer. If Shu continued disturbing their slumber, they were at risk of having nervous breakdowns. There was a case here in Los Angeles. A man's neighbors were making so much noise that he couldn't sleep. They wouldn't listen to reason. So he killed them. The court found him not guilty. He didn't spend a day in jail. If your daughter's case was in the US, it's highly likely that her poisoners would have escaped justice too. With enough justification, they can get away with anything. Your daughter was wrong in the first place. Tsinghua University didn't act to correct her behavior. They were wrong in the second, and her poisoners in the third. All three parties were at fault. But if they really wanted to harm your daughter, they could have done so earlier. Because the first poisoning was ineffective, they increased the dosage the second time. The result was unexpected. This wasn't what they wanted. They just wanted to make your daughter sick so that she'd have to repeat the year. They just wanted to sleep. The people involved in handling the case back then all advocated downplaying the situation, not wanting to ruin the lives of the three poisoners because of your daughter's flaws. And besides, no one was killed. Now it's a few years later. Everyone's living peacefully. I suggest that you do your daughter a favor and let these three people live well. If the whole world knows that your daughter was a public nuisance in the dorms, would you and your wife not feel shame? The internet describes how excellent your daughter was, but honestly, I don't see it. A person who does what she wants, who speaks badly, who doesn't care about other people's feelings, who affects other people's sleep, has no business being called excellent. If your daughter had kept to her bedtime, respected her classmates, and had good relations with her dorm mates, would she be suffering such a miserable fate today? Your daughter failed so much as a human being that she's ended up in this situation. If there is an afterlife, you and your wife should first teach your daughter how to behave, how to respect people, how to get along with people, treat people generously, do public service, and become a person who can contribute to the nation. That is true excellence. Monterey Park, Los Angeles, USA. May 31st, 2013. Zhu's family immediately notified the authorities about the letter and gave it to them for analysis. They were able to establish that it had indeed been mailed from the US, though strangely, it had been written on a piece of A4 paper, an uncommon size in the States. The fact that the letter had come from the US once again placed the eye of suspicion firmly on Sun. That being said, the phrasing suggested that the writer wasn't actively involved in Xu's poisoning, only that they were aware of the three people who were. It also seems ridiculous that Sun, the only real suspect in the case, would potentially incriminate herself further by sending it. Wouldn't she want to keep a low profile? In theory, it's possible that the real poisoner may have also fled to the US, 
and sent the letter to keep the attention on Sun. Or perhaps the note truly was written by an honest third party, and Zhu really was poisoned by three of her sleep-deprived dorm mates. Or maybe this letter was nothing more than a hoax. Since we don't know who sent it, we can't say one way or the other. Today, Xu Ling is 50 years old. Her poisoner, or poisoners, remain unidentified. Her family went on to sue the hospital that treated her for their misdiagnosis and terrible treatment methods. They were awarded a compensation payment of 100,000 yuan, approximately $14,000. A huge thank you to my top tier members on YouTube and Patreon. Hamish K, Sonic Narcotic, Itai Alon, Nefus1988, Lydia Kumo, Alex Greensaw, Asia Mina, Brad Hammer33, Azriel Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, Gina Valera, Ian Bellock, Infamous Sempapi, Jesse Jug, Leonardo Martinez, Hamish, Monica Mendoza, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Peter Logdredge, Philip Wester, Taylor and Monica Gruink, The Only Dorita, TNS Mum, and Zane. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Also, a thank you to Robin Mickelson for making the bell icon animation, and Kyoto Roboto, who helped narrate a section of this video. Links to their work down below.